Hello and welcome to this tutorial. It is another in the series of Approaching the Patient With for Teach Me Surgery. Today we're going to focus on Approaching the Patient with Postoperative Pain. And in doing so, we're going to begin with the importance of pain management. We'll proceed to talk about how we might assess the patient with postoperative pain and then what we might do to manage the patient with postoperative pain. So why is managing post-op pain so important? Well, first and foremost, there's a humanitarian aspect. As doctors, we want to alleviate patient suffering as much as we can. This, of course, extends to post-op patients. But secondly, it's worth considering that reducing patients' post-op pain can reduce their risk of developing post-op complications. Consider a patient who's undergone abdominal surgery. This patient in significant pain will be reluctant to deep breathe and as a result, may be predisposed to post-op pneumonia. Consider another surgical patient who's in significant pain, which is preventing them from mobilizing early on after surgery. This reduced mobility will predispose them to deep vein thrombosis and possibly to pulmonary embolus. Having considered the crucial importance of managing patients' post-op pain, we move to consider how we might assess a patient with post-op pain. And there are three things that we should consider in this assessment. The first is observing the patient from the end of the bed. As we have discussed in other tutorials, this can provide vital clues. It is particularly important in assessing the patient in post-op pain because if you are able to observe them without them knowing, knowing you are specifically assessing them, it will give you a clearer, more objective indication of what their pain level is. For example, if you approach a patient to assess them and they are fast asleep, it is unlikely that they are in significantly severe pain. However, if you approach a patient who is bent over double in pain, so far that they are unable to notice your presence until you speak to them, it is likely they are in quite significant pain. Let us move now to consider what we might gain from the history. But before we do so, it's important to consider the differential diagnoses because in the patient with post-op pain, we're in the advantage position of being able to work out a differential diagnosis before we go to see the patient. First up is the possibility that this is post-op pain. In true post-op pain, the pain is related to the disease process for which the procedure was undertaken and also related to the tissue damage sustained by the operation itself. Secondly, it is important to consider that the pain may be related to, in fact, a post-op complication for which the patient may require additional attention. And finally, an unlikely but possible is that the pain arises from a completely separate pathology to that which the procedure was carried out for. With our differential in mind, we can proceed to history taking and information gathering. A good place to start with this is to consider the operation the patient has had and what was the reason for this procedure. Furthermore, a good piece of information to have is whether the procedure went smoothly. This piece of information can be gathered from the patient themselves, from the staff available or from the operation note. Gathering this information about the operation can be particularly useful to prime us as to whether we're expecting a great deal of post-operative pain and as to whether we're expecting any post-operative complications. Having considered the operation, we can move to collect some other collateral information. We may start with the anaesthetic chart and the drug chart. How recently has the patient had analgesia? Was it effective for them? We can also consider information that the staff may have available. Do the nursing staff believe this patient is in significant pain? or is anxiety a significant component of this patient's pain? Having gathered this background information, we can then proceed onto the pain history. Important points to consider in the pain history are the timing of the pain, when did it come on, and how long has it been there? In certain operations, the anaesthetist will employ techniques such as nerve blocks, and these tend to wear off quite suddenly. The patient will be hit with the re-emergence of the pain and this can require quite significant analgesia at this time. Consider the location of the pain. Does this fit with 
true post-op pain? Or do we have to strongly consider whether this is a post-op complication? Consider any associated symptoms. In abdominal surgery, it might be pertinent to consider nausea and vomiting and constipation. Finally, take a pain score from the patient. There is significant debate around whether the subjective pain score from the patient or an observed pain score from a member of nursing staff or from a doctor is the best way to go. But you could employ both. The benefit of taking a pain score is it allows us to track the progress of any intervention we've made for a patient's pain. The first part of the examination is looking at the patient's observations. These should be immediately available, but you could ask for them repeated if you wanted. One difficulty with the observations when considering post-op pain is there is significant overlap between systemic inflammatory response syndrome criteria and the signs and symptoms of pain. One important distinguishing sign is the blood pressure. If the patient was suffering with SIRS, perhaps with sepsis, then they might be suffering with a low blood pressure. However, if the patient is suffering with pain alone, then we might expect that the blood pressure actually rises. In a similar fashion, a capillary refill can be quite useful. We wouldn't expect the patient in simple post-op pain to be suffering with a reduced capillary refill time. Having looked at the observations, we can then proceed to examine the area. It is important to consider whether it's absolutely necessary to examine an area that's just been operated on. Observation may suffice, or observation and auscultation may suffice. Using your clinical judgment, you should determine this. If you do decide to examine, it is appropriate to start your examination gently and away from the site of the operation. The final part of the examination of the post-op pain patient is to ask the patient to deep breathe and cough. This is particularly important in patients who have had abdominal surgery or thorax surgery. If a patient is able to deep breathe and cough, it may signify that their, their pain is not that severe. It may also signify that they are less likely to suffer with the post-op complication of pneumonia. Having gathered information from the history and examination, we move on to our next steps. These may include ordering any investigations that we feel are relevant to rule out post-op complications, or perhaps to rule them in, and deciding when and if to discuss the patient with a senior. If we're particularly concerned about a patient, we may call the senior urgently. If we're less concerned, perhaps it could wait until the next ward round. Finally, we'll proceed to manage the pain. In this management section, we consider how to manage true post-op pain. As mentioned earlier, that is this which we consider to be caused by the original pathology or caused by the tissue trauma during surgery. Within this category, we have non-pharmacological management and pharmacological management. Non-pharmacological management consists of things which are quite simple but can have a great impact on how much pain the patient's feeling. As mentioned earlier, Reducing a patient's anxiety levels can quite significantly reduce their subjective experience of pain. Another important step to take is to consider whether the patient is positioned appropriately for the site of their wound. So we move to consider the pharmacological management of post-op pain. Once again, we reiterate that it's important to find out what has worked for the patient so far. If the patient has had previous operations, what worked for them at that time. Having done that, we can move to use the WHO analgesic ladder. This begins with simple analgesics, which means paracetamol. Paracetamol alone is unlikely to be sufficient for a patient with post-op pain. However, it is important to use as an adjunct. NSAIDs are an excellent medication for post-op pain. However, as we know, NSAIDs have a number of contraindications. We need to consider whether the patient has had a recent renal function test and check this. We also need to consider whether the patient is at risk of developing peptic ulceration.
Another thing for consideration with prescription of an NSAID, as with all of these medications, is how recently did the patient have an NSAID. In particular, it's important to check the anaesthetic chart, as an anaesthetist may have given a PR NSAID or an IV NSAID. Having considered paracetamol and NSAIDs, we move to consider the available opioid management. Within the category of opioids, most importantly in this situation, we have codeine and we have morphine. And in particular, we have an oral preparation of morphine, commonly referred to as oromorph. When deciding which of these to use and how to dose it, we again need to consider how recently the patient had an opioid treatment. We also need to consider how severe the pain is. If we consider the patient's pain is so severe that it cannot be managed with oral morphine and that the patient may, may require intravenous morphine, it is probably worthwhile to contact a senior surgeon followed by an anaesthetist to arrange a patient-controlled analgesia system for the patient. If the oral route is not appropriate for the patient, but the pain isn't severe enough to, to warrant a PCA system, it may be appropriate to offer the patient intramuscular morphine. Whenever we prescribe an opioid treatment, we need to consider the side effects associated with such treatment. These include respiratory depression, nausea and vomiting, and constipation. There are certain things we can do to mitigate these risks, and we'll return to that shortly. Having selected appropriate analgesia for the postdoc patient, it is important once more to perform certain safety checks. These include rechecking the patient's allergies and sensitivities to ensure there's no crossover with the proposed prescription, and also rechecking any contraindications. If prescribing an opioid, it may be important to check that the patient is being appropriately observed particularly if you're about to commence a morphine preparation in an opiate-naive patient. When selecting certain analgesic agents, it may be appropriate to prescribe certain other medications alongside. In particular, when using opioids, it is often considered best practice to prescribe an as-required antiemetic and an as-required laxative for the patient. Finally, the importance of communication cannot be overstated. This is communication not only with the patient, but also with the nursing staff. It is important that the nursing staff agree to the management plan that you've proposed. Perhaps they have some suggestions of how it might be further improved. Allowing the patient the opportunity to agree to the management plan will greatly enhance the effect of any analgesic intervention. In summary, in this tutorial, we have considered the importance of post-op analgesia for preventing post-op complications and its importance from a humanitarian point of view. We have considered a method for assessing a patient with post-op pain, and we have considered both pharmacological and non-pharmacological methods of managing post-op pain.